Hello, everybody. This is Brother Luke, Sin City Preacher. Welcome to this Wednesday night Bible study for the Church of the Eternally Secure. Woohoo! I'm so happy we're here again tonight. And this is uh, um, going to be a different kind of experience for Renee and Cripps and myself. I don't know if the audience will notice the difference, except I think you'll see that the uh, uh, some of the features will be enhanced. Some of the uh, video properties of this uh, program, uh, you'll notice uh, we're, we're doing better. How is that possible? Well, hidden behind the scenes is we have a, a magician uh, called the Wizard of Oz. <laughs> Actually, it's Brother Matthias. He's doing some wizardry uh, to produce this program. This is what we're going to have to do all the time, uh, beginning uh, August 1st. Uh, and um, thankfully, uh, Matthias uh, has the expertise to, to make this happen. Uh, if we didn't know how to do this kind of a program, uh, as I told you before, uh, beginning August 1st, uh, we would not be able to have live group discussions. You will be able to have a live program by yourself but you can't have panelists on. So those programs that you like that are group discussions, if they don't learn how to uh, uh, adapt, then they won't be able to do it. And that's a sad thing. But thankfully, Brother Matthias is, is uh, knowledgeable and helpful. Uh, and But we, we're starting it now rather than waiting till the 1st of August because we want to get a little, gain a little experience doing this uh, before uh, YouTube pulls the rug out from uh, uh, under us. <clears throat> so if you notice any differences, that's that's the reason for it. Um, so now uh, it's the Wednesday night Bible study for the Church of the Eternally Secure. And if you have not seen the Wednesday Bible studies before, if you go to my uh, YouTube page, Sin, Sin City Preacher, there's a playlist uh, titled Wednesday night Bible studies. Click on that. And you can see the archive of all the Bible studies that we've done. Uh, right now, we're working our way through the Pauline epistles. We finished our, our Romans completely a couple of weeks ago, and uh, now we're beginning uh, the second chapter of First Corinthians. So we're going to begin uh, chapter 2, verse 1 tonight. Uh, so uh, now that you understand that, let me ask our Brother Cripps and Sister Renee to say hi to everybody. And maybe somebody doesn't know you, Renee. Uh, tell them why I call you the untwisted sister. Hey, guys. Uh, my lovely moniker, my term of endearment, Brother Luke gave me the untwisted sister because I spend my time defending the gospel and untwisting verses people use to try to tell you that salvation is based on something other than faith alone and what Christ did for us. Um, and uh, a lot of those uh, verses they use, they end up trying to take away our blessed hope, our blessed assurance, uh, and try to make uh, instruction on how we should be living or things not even written to us that was under the law and apply them to uh, uh, grace. And and it's uh, confusing people. So I do my best to uh, explain those verses in context, thus the name. So I'm happy to be here with you guys tonight. Thanks for joining me last night too. Amen. Uh, we had a wonderful time last night. Uh, Sister Renee has just recently began hosting her own uh, uh, live hangouts or uh, group discussions. And uh, I was able to join her last night and we had a great time talking about eternal security with Brother Dave. Uh, <clears throat> so watch that if you haven't seen it. And uh, we also have Brother Cripps here with us on the Wednesday Bible Studies. So Brother Cripps, um, if someone doesn't know what you're doing on YouTube, tell them about it. Yeah, thanks, Brother Luke. And uh, if you haven't, if anyone hasn't had a chance to see the uh, show from last night, please go uh, uh, check it out. It will be a blessing to you and be edifying for you as well. So make sure and give it a listen. Uh, my name is Jason Cripps. I'm part of a channel called True Story Live. And we come on Sunday night at 9 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. And uh, we uh, have discussions uh, with people. And uh, it's okay if you don't all agree uh, we're not all on the same page necessarily, uh, but uh, we we talk about uh, different issues, um, uh, psychological and philosophical. But uh, at the bottom line of everything is uh, contending for the the faith as well. 
And uh, I'm also on this program once a week on Church of the Trinity Secure, doing the Bible studies, which I very much enjoy, and on uh, Talking Doctrine on Monday nights with Monday's Milk. And um, I try to say yes to whenever anyone asks me to be on uh, something. Um, I just uh, enjoy uh, these broadcasts, and I'm glad that Matthias is going to be able to uh, figure out a way to make it work so that no one can take our ability to reach others and to have these discussions. So I'm happy to be here. And hello to everyone in the chat. You guys are awesome. Okay, yeah, amen. Uh, regarding the chat, uh, let me say hello to everybody in the chat. The chat, uh, you're really the congregation of the Church of the Eternally Secure. Uh, I know some people may be watching but don't participate in the chat, but uh, you're all part of this congregation. And in the chat room, though, it's like you're in the, uh, let's say you're, you're sitting in the pews in the church here, and so you, uh, you should be paying attention to the subject that's being discussed instead of having all kinds of side conversations about other, other things. Uh, obviously, uh, there's other interesting things and other needs to talk about amongst yourselves. But uh, as, as much as possible, I, I hope you'll pay attention to the study, the text that we're going over and, and stay on the same subject with us. And uh, so uh, I, rather than acknowledge everybody individually, uh, hey, thank you, everybody in the chat room for being there. And if you're a moderator, don't forget the two things that I hope you'll be able to do is uh, don't let trolls uh, ruin our fellowship. And also, uh, if someone's new, take some time to, to acknowledge them and welcome them. OK. All right. We're ready to begin. So the producer behind the scenes is going to be show, posting up the, the uh, verses. We're going to look at the verses in three different translations, the KJV, the Amplified and the uh, New American Bible Revised Edition. And uh, as we discuss them. So let's go. Uh, uh, First Corinthians, chapter two, verse one. No, just post them there and I'll read them. Thank you. Um, okay. And I, brethren, when I came to you, came not with excellency of speech or of wisdom, declaring unto you the testimony of God. Um, let's, let's stop there. And I want everybody to, you know, we've talked a lot in the, in the previous chapter uh, about Paul's, um, these five problems that he was informed. Uh, he was li living in uh, Ephesus. Uh, he established the, first, the Corinthian church, and then he gets letters saying there's problems in the Corinthian church, and uh, he's writing a letter to address five problems. And one of them is about this subject of this, uh, uh, oops, it's not showing up here, the, uh, the verses again. Let me see, where is it? I don't see the verse any, anymore, Matthias. Um, okay, well, if you can remember the verse, let me ask Renee uh, uh, on that verse, chapter 2, verse 1. Uh, give me your thoughts on that, Sister Renee. Yeah, it uh, goes back to Paul saying, hey, uh, in the Old Testament, where it says, where is the wisdom of the wise? You know, where is the scribe? And that he saved us by the foolishness of preaching, not by some, you know, um, great oration and deep philosophy, but in its simplicity. And Paul continues here by stating, uh, uh, when I came to you, I came not with excellently of speech or wisdom. So he's not uh, complicating it to make him not pontificating. I want to say, I think the fun word pontificate is funny because when you use it, you actually are pontificating. <laughs> but, <laughs> <laughs> Get it? But yeah. uh, um, he's not uh, trying to overcomplicate it. He just came with simplicity of speech and and simple truth, so that the message itself would be the focus, uh, not himself. Uh, and it says, declaring unto you the testimony of God, which we will hear what that testimony is in just a moment. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. Uh, the the idea that. Uh... Uh, he's not coming with excellency of speech 
were of wisdom. Uh, he's saying that for a couple of reasons. But that, that first of all, he's not known as an orator. He's not impressive in person. He's, he acknowledges that in another letter, uh, saying that he realizes that in person he's not impressive, but his letters uh, are impressive. Uh, but the problem is in the Corinthian church, at that time in history, these people are very impressed with orators and philosophers. So that's why he's saying, you're not going to get oratory for me or wisdom like philosophy. Uh, you, you know, so he what he's doing is showing us that he's got a simple message at the cross. And uh, Brother Cripps, let me get your thoughts on, on uh, verse one. Yeah, Paul wasn't a slick car salesman. That's what it makes me think of. The all the all the people that come up with their slick words and their easy talk, their uh, oration. Um, uh, uh, Paul saying he's not coming to you like that. Excellency of speech. All these uh, at that time, uh, and I've said this on a few other broadcasts. At that time, these people would come and stand up on a on some kind of pulpit or whatever, and they would talk to the people. And the more mesmerizing the words, the the more people seem to enjoy it. And uh, people got good at that, uh, good at talking to crowds. So Paul's saying right, right here from the beginning, when he came to them, he didn't use any of that. He wasn't a car salesman. He was simply uh, declaring unto them the testimony of God, pure and simple and lovely. And it didn't need to be any more than that. And like Renee said, it wasn't... It was so that he didn't draw attention to himself. Um, my theory is that Paul could have talked like that if he'd wanted to, because he had to understand the way that the other people were using their words to mesmerize and and to draw other people in. If he wanted to use excellency of speech, I think he absolutely could have, but uh, he made a, a personal choice not to. So the focus would be where it deserves to be, which is on the gospel, the testimony of God. Okay, uh, I, I'm not so sure that uh, uh, I'm going to go along with your premise that he had the ability to be a great orator if he chose to. Uh, I don't know. Maybe you're right. I just don't know that we can uh, find any real proof of that, I, even though we know that he was a scholar and he was very, very learned. But some people are skillful with written word and not with the spoken word, and that seems to be the case with Paul. But I'd like to look at it in the Amplified now. So let's uh, show the first one in the Amplified. It says, And when I came to you, brothers and sisters, proclaiming to you the testimony of God concerning salvation through Christ, I did not come with superiority of speech or of wisdom, no lofty words of eloquence or of philosophy as a Greek orator might do. Uh, it looks to me like the Amplified's expounded. See that for some of you, if you're new uh, to this Bible study, and my particular uh, preference of it is that we, I think the three of us, I, it's safe to identify Renee, Cripps, and myself as uh, KJV Firstus. I was a KJV onlyist for 25 years, um, but I still believe the KJV is the scriptures that we need to uh, test all other translations against the KJV. Uh, so we read the KJV, but sometimes uh, looking at another translation can be helpful. And I like the Amplified because I think that the name Amplified Translation or Amplified Bible uh, is very descriptive of what they're attempting to do. They are amplifying the verse. They're expounding or they're commenting uh, on the verse, just as we're attempting to do. We read the verse in the KJV, and they were expounding, telling you what that verse means in our own words. And the Amplified does that. So you get a little bit more of an uh, explanation of uh, the meaning of the verse. Uh, but as I said, I don't recommend you use the Amplified or anything else unless you're always comparing it to the KJV. And you will, you will be shocked to find that the modern translations sometimes will have a serious uh, conflict with the KJV, uh, that we have, to, we have to be aware of that. Um, so that's the, uh, the Amplified. Let me get uh, Renee's 
uh, thoughts. Uh, any, any more on that than before I look at the footnotes uh, in the NABRE? No, I, I'm glad. I, I see what they did there, though. They took the surrounding contextual verses to add about, you know, like a Greek orator. They were they, they were explaining what he meant by that, and that was good. Yeah. Now, you notice that uh, when I gave my first remarks on verse 1, uh, I had not read the Amplified yet. I don't go ahead and study and prepare for these. We, we're kind of flying by the seat of our pants each night. We don't prepare. But uh, the, the way I amplified on the verse was pretty much the way that the Amplified Translation also amplified. Exactly right. That's exactly right. Yeah. So in this case, uh, either uh, I'm in agreement with them or they're in agreement with me. But let's look at also uh, the, uh, the translation of the NABRE. Not so much am I interested in the uh, translation as much as I am the footnotes in this case. It says, when I came to you, brothers, proclaiming the mystery of God, I did not come with sublimity of words or of wisdom. Well, there's not a lot of great uh, amplification there at all, but uh, the, there is a footnote. and It says, the mystery of God, that is God's secret, known only to himself, is his plan for the salvation of his people. It is clear from 1 Corinthians 1, 18 to 25, and 2 verse 2 and 8 through 10 that this secret involves Jesus and the cross in place of mystery other good manuscripts read testimony all right so that's the that's the footnotes now the thing that we're, the reason I've been decided to adopt the uh, NABRE into the study is because uh, on the KJV I have no footnotes on the amplified there is one footnote it says in verse one one early ms reads mystery uh, that's the only footnote uh you know, there's another one on verse two but uh this particular translation the nabre uh it has a lot of footnotes that sometimes these footnotes can be very very helpful uh okay we're going to go to the next verse unless uh, crips or uh renee want to say more about verse one okay so let's go to verse 2 in the KJV. It says, I'm going to read them together because there is, uh, there are kind of connected thoughts here. It says, and I, and I, brethren, when I came to you, came not with excellency of speech or of wisdom, declaring unto you the testimony of God. For I determined not to know anything among you save Jesus Christ and him crucified. Uh, Brother Cripps, you want to go first on verse 2? Yeah, there it is. He says uh, right at the beginning of the verse, for I determined not to know anything among you save Jesus Christ and him crucified. He, kn he knows other things. He, he could have added other things into it, but he was determined, which is a choice, to just focus on Jesus Christ and him crucified and nothing else. Um, I would say that his knowledge of other things was vast, again, because he in order to refute some of the other things being said by the orators of his time, he had to be aware of what they were saying. And if he's focusing in on Jesus Christ alone and him crucified, and that's all he's bringing to the table, and he's determining to do that, then that was purposeful for the people around him. And again, as Renee had uh, shared at the beginning uh, with verse 1, um, so as not to draw any attention to himself. I just, when I think of these orators and the way that they're looked up to even now, especially the Greek ones, they're just thought to be these great people. I mean, they, they, they just think that they're just like, oh, greatest things since sliced bread before they even had sliced bread. Um, yeah, so uh, I, I just think he's, he's setting up this whole chapter Again, focusing in on the point, which is Jesus Christ and the gospel of him. Okay. Uh, before I forget this, uh, I, in chapter one, um, at a certain point when we were talking about the orators, um, uh, I said that uh, I, I made some videos on this talking about how people can easily be swayed by the orator's skill or the passion. Yeah. Uh, the speaker 
Um, and I, I told about some of the videos I made uh, arguing that you don't, you have to go with what the scriptures say. Don't let some silver tongued devil uh, persuade you just because they're a great speaker. Yep. And I mentioned some people, there was someone I couldn't remember, but it just came to me. I believe it, uh, his name is Carter Conlon. Uh, and he's really, I mean, he could have probably been a great actor. Uh, he could have been on the stage performing with, with great drama. Uh, he's, his, he had a sermon called Run. And his message basically was, if someone tells you you're saved by faith alone, run out of that church as fast as you can. Run, run, run away from faith alone. You know, of course, we have the opposite message. Run away from the churches. They're telling you faith alone is not enough that you have to contribute uh, a certain degree of changed life and keep your fingers crossed, hoping that you've changed enough because it's faith plus works. Run from those churches is, is our message. So we're in diametrically opposed to that message by Carter Conlon. But the point is, if you listen to that speech, you'll be blown away by the power of his oratory. Uh, and so um, Renee, I get your thoughts on verse two and then I'm gonna read it in the Amplified. Yeah. Uh, you know who is lifted up now like the Greek philosophers were? The Hindu gurus that have come over and started the New Age movement in America. You'll see uh, the Maharaji or Deepak Chopra. These are the ones that actually sound so deep and they say nothing. They're saying nothing, but they sound so deep and metaphysical and people elevate them like Oprah Winfrey. You got them and then you got the self-helpers, the feel-gooders, the prosperity guys. And you, like Brother Luke said, passion and likability and charisma is no substitute for truth. That's why I tell people, tell everything uh, I say, check it against scripture. Because if I convince you of something and you don't check it against scripture, then somebody better than me or more charismatic than I am is going to convince you of something otherwise. We can't be swayed to and fro with everyone to doctrine. So um, I love what he says here uh, for I determined he had made up his mind. I am not going to know anything among you. I'm not bringing in knowledge of the law. I'm not bringing in knowledge of the scriptures, except the testimony of God, which is Jesus Christ and him crucified. That was the testimony that God gave him to give to the Gentiles was the testimony of God that he had sent his son, God manifest in the flesh, to, to die on the cross and be resurrected again three days later, according to the scriptures, to pay the sin debt of the world so that all who trust in him can have eternal life. And I'm telling you, if anybody tells you that salvation's got something to do with your works and that something more than trusting in your savior is required, run. I'm telling you that. And mm -hmm. so would everybody else on this uh, panel. Yeah. Amen. Not Jesus yeah. plus me, worthy as the Lamb and Renee. It's worthy as the Lamb. Period. It's how you know how great Thou art, not how great I art. It's all about Jesus. Amen. So he said uh, Christ and Him crucified. He didn't know anything, but Christ and Him crucified, and that's what we say for salvation. Every one of us on this panel. Yep. Well, I'd like to say that Paul uh, uh, is very impressive, even though we can get the impression that he's not impressive in person. He's not a great speaker, but I don't believe I can think of anybody in the Bible who is more impressive intellectually and scholastically over Paul. Uh, the Bible uh, is 66 books written over a 1500 year span um, and written in four different co continents uh, by over 40 different men. And, and uh, they're from various walks of life and meager, like fishermen uh, and, and esteemed, like kings and generals. But the only scholar uh, that I can know of, I may correct me if I'm wrong, I might very well be wrong, but the only one I know that would be classified as a scholar is Saul of Tarsus, later became known as the Apostle Paul. He was renowned for his uh, a skill, uh, he studied with the biggest. Uh, rabbis, uh, authoritative, uh, respected rabbi Gamaliel, uh, he was the best at, the, at that time, and Paul was his protege. 
and, and Paul also studied the, all the philosophers. He was capable. He could have talked about philosophy, and he did. It depended on, on the audience sometimes. But let's let's look at the Amplified now, verse 2. And the Amplified, expand. I think it will expand a little bit more on that. Um, it says, uh, for I made the decision. See, uh, Brother Cripps, you're right. He made the decision to... Uh, to not uh, speak as an elevated person. He said, he said I, I made the decision to know nothing, that is, to forego philosophical and theological discussions regarding inconsequential things and opinions while, while among you, except Jesus Christ and him crucified, and the meaning of his redemptive substitutionary death and his resurrection. Amen. So again, I, I'd say that the Amplified uh, nailed it perfectly. Uh, yeah. Renee or Cripps, any more on, on verse two? Yeah, I just wanted to tell you what Sister Paula in the she's so helpful and knowledgeable. Uh, she said the word I think it's chrysotome, chrysotome or chrysotome means golden mouth when mm. it's referring to like words of gold. You know, she said that's one of the Greek words used there that he he, he didn't come that way. Yeah. So I just wanted to share that because Paula had put it up. Yeah. Kind of like what I said, but I use silver instead of uh, gold. That's I right. Silver tongue silver, devils. That's right. Silver tongue devils. <laughs> yeah. I call them car salesmen. It's all, all means the same thing. It's just just yeah. lick words and, hey, let me get you in a car today. Let me get you in a, in a false gospel today. Yeah. And uh, by the way, uh, since you brought up the chat room, hello, Sister Paula and everybody else, but. Uh, uh, if you're in the chat room and you want to either ask a question or make a statement that you want a response to, uh, you need to shout it out. So type it in all caps. And, and, and as I scroll through it quickly, if I see something in all caps, I'll stop and read it and, and try to respond. Okay, so uh, we do want to interact with you as much as we can here. Uh, all right, let's go to uh, verse 3 in the KJV. He says, and I was with you in weakness and in fear uh, and in much trembling. Um, I'm going to read verse 4 along with it. And my speech and my preaching was not with enticing words of man's wisdom, but in demonstration of the spirit and of power. It has a colon there, but I'm going to stop there. Verse 3 and 4, uh, Sister Renee. Yeah, it sounds like Paul was nervous. He's nervous in public speaking. Uh, let me see here. Uh, when he says, and I was with you in weakness and in fear and in much trembling. And my speech and my preaching was not with enticing words of man's wisdom, but in demonstration of the spirit and power. Um, that's where you stopped, right? Yeah. Yeah. So, I mean, it sounds like he really wanted to keep it simple and focused on Christ and the message at hand. All right. You know, Moses uh, had a speak, public speaking thing, too, didn't he? So, So I, I think God uses uh, the weakness or the foolishness of men to confound the wise. He, he picks those that the world would seem uh, think are weak. And he lifts them up. So everybody knows that whatever power they're walking in, it, it's from God and not S from himself. Sister Renee, Sister Renee I'm, I'm, I'm a little bit sensitive. You said the foolishness of men. <laughs> I mean, are you insinuating that men are the foolish? Come on. Me. <laughs> Me. Okay. She says men generically as uh, humanity. Foolishness of people. So don't if you're a man, don't be offended and be some kind of a I think she's a sexist against men. No. OK, Brother Cripps, uh, verses three and four. Sure. First of all, I've never been offended by Renee at all. Never, never been offensive towards me or any other man that I know of. Um, yeah. So this reminds me of a story when I was uh, 15, 16, 17 years old. And uh, in our youth group, there was a guy that came and he was uh, pretty severely developmentally uh challenged that's that's the we didn't call it that back then 
Um, but I think that's the most appropriate way to refer to it now. And he was a believer, and um, he very rarely ever said anything, but they brought him up on stage one time, and he had to have help because he, he couldn't really walk on his own either. But he would come up there, and he would it would take him a long time to get each word out, and he would just say, and I'm not going to imitate him, but he would just say very slowly and painstakingly, I love Jesus. He's my Savior. And that had more power over me than hours and hours and hours of hearing these youth pastors and, and special guests come up and, and speak with all their flair and all their, their words and all that. I'm not saying that what they were saying was wrong necessarily. My point is that even if we're challenged and we have difficulty in speech, if we're saying in front of a group of people what we put our focus on and who our Savior is, that to me has more power than anything. Mm -hmm. um, so even if Paul did have some kind of problem, which I, I, I don't really think that, but even if he had a problem speaking, even with Moses, I, I look back at the verses about Moses and I think that he was just making excuses. So I can't speak. I think he was trying to get out of the whole thing. That's just my opinion. Um, but either way, God does use our weaknesses, whatever our weaknesses are, in our weakness, he is made strong. So that's very clear. Um, verse verse four is just him saying the same point. He's not enticing. He's not using enticing words. Um, and this is important, man's wisdom. How much man's wisdom, Renee mentioned, um, uh, uh, I can't think of the guy's name, but uh, uh, there's plenty of people that Oprah holds up and it's that fluffy. I agree exactly with what Renee said about they're They're not saying anything. It's word salad. It's a lot of words thrown together to make it seem like it should, oh, that's powerful. Oh, get, get her little stamp on it. And when you read it, 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 they're saying nothing. A lot of it's repetitive. A lot of it's just just fluffy stuff, and it means nothing. But the Bible means everything. It's the living word of God. And the testimony of Jesus Christ means everything. Uh, it is literally life. It brings us life. And um, I think I think Paul's just saying, look, I didn't come to you uh, using the man's wisdom or enticing words. I'm not a, a, a car salesman or a silver tongued devil. Um, none of that. I'm just being straight up with you and I'm just preaching the gospel. That's it. Hmm. All right. Thank you. Uh, my Bible here, uh, I told you, has 66 books in it let me see there's looks to me like there's in this particular printing uh, there's uh, about 1700 pages there's a lot of content in here i was talking to my wife earlier today about something and how profound it was and i said but you know there's thousands of profound verses in the bible and, and uh, yeah. that's why i can read the bible for 32 years and uh i never stop getting blown away by the deep meanings of it, and you uncover more and more as you as you continue on. You'll never run out of uh, new revelations and deeper understandings of the scriptures. But if you read Old Man the Sea, or uh, uh, let's say, what's that one about the bird? Um, the, to Kill a Mockingbird. You know, if you read popular books like that, if you read them two or three times, I mean, you're, you've exhausted it. You you've got everything out of that book you're going to get. Uh, so the Bible, there's so much to be learned from the Bible, but I've often said this, if you got everything in the wrong, Bible wrong, every theological subject that's, that's in the Bible, and there's a lot, if you got it all wrong, but at least you got right who Jesus is and how do I get saved? And that's what our core doctrines are based upon. Uh, the, the, who is Jesus? He's God himself manifest in the flesh. How do you get saved? Faith alone in Christ alone, and you have eternal security. If that's all you ever get right, then you're in good standing with God, and, and that's, that's what really matters. That's, what, that's why we call it essentials. Um, so there's uh, a lot to, uh, to get out of the Bible, but um, now I wanted to talk about uh, the amplified translation of these verses, but I did see, I missed the footnote 
on verse 2 in the Amplified. So let me read this footnote. It says, uh, in reality, Paul was a highly trained student of the Old Testament writings, Jewish law, and of logic and rhetoric. And evidently, he was conversant in Roman law as well. When preaching the gospel, however, he focused on the message itself and the power of God and not on rhetorical techniques of persuasion. Uh, so again, that, that footnote is in agreement with the point we're making. And the point Paul's making here is that he's focused on, on the one thing that is absolutely essential. Who this Jesus is and what he accomplished for you. And that's his entire focus. And it kind of reminds me of some of the people that argue against us sometimes saying, you just focus on the Bible. Stop talking about all these other subjects. Well, everything in the Bible is uh, is important. Uh, they, they're not, they don't rise to the same level of importance as these essentials. So we should not act like the other things don't matter. But the, the, the gospel and the identity of Jesus, that is penultimate. There is nothing that can cut rises to that level. Now, I read the Amplified uh, for these verses 3 and 4, and it says, um, I came to you in a state of weakness and fear and great trembling, and my message and my preaching were not in persuasive words of wisdom using clever rhetoric, but they were delivered in, uh, in demonstration of the Holy Spirit operating through me and of his power, stirring the minds of the listeners and persuading them. Uh, so that's the amplified. Uh, I'm going to look at the footnote here in the in the NABRE, and then I'll ask your other thoughts on that, Renee and Cripps. Uh, it says, uh, verse 3, the footnote is, the weakness of the crucified Jesus is reflected in Paul's own bearing, uh, fear and much trembling, a reverential fear based on a sense of God's transcendence permeates Paul's existence and preaching. Uh, so it seems like they're saying that it's not Paul's fear of public speaking. Uh, you know, it's, it's, it's just God's awe, his awe of his responsibility to God. Yeah. And he says, compare his advice to the Philippians to, to work out their salvation with fear and trembling in Philippians 2.12, because God is at work in them, uh, just as his exalting power was paradoxically at work in the emptying, uh, humiliation, and obedience of Jesus to death on the cross. So that's the footnote on verse 3. And the footnote on verse 4 is, among many manuscript readings here, the best is either, quote, not with the persuasion of wisdom, unquote, or, quote, not with persuasive words of wisdom, unquote, which differ only in a nuance. Whichever reading is accepted, the efficacy of human wisdom for salvation is contrasted with the power of the cross. So uh, I would say that what we should get out of this, too, is that uh, the, the simplicity of the cross, the fact that Jesus said uh, we need to be like little children, we don't have to be have advanced degrees and a great, great education and uh, be great thinkers. This message is simple, to, uh, and easy to understand, and it's easy to receive faith alone. Uh, okay, Renee and Cripps, are more, any more thoughts on that? I was just going to say he was uh, walking in supernatural power as well. And I think, you know, he let the miraculous also speak. Um, on God's behalf, rather than a lot of words, he actually showed the power of, of God with uh, of whom he came from. And once people knew uh, through the manifest, because it says, you know, he mentions those that work miracles and and heal and so forth in another chapter. Um, I think he used that to get them to hear the simple message um, also. Mm hmm. Mm -hmm. Brother Cripps, any thoughts on the uh, after the, I read the Amplified and the footnotes? Uh, I don't think so. I think I, I think we're all on the same page what it, what it means. I'm ready to move on if you are. Okay. All right. Well, then we're going to go to the KJV and look at verses uh, uh, six. Five. I'm going to read the four and five. Oh yeah. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. 
Thank you. Uh, uh, I skipped verse five. Matthias just spoke, but he says when he speaks, he, his, his audience won't hear it because he's got that muted. So if you're wondering what I'm responding to, it wasn't the Holy Spirit speaking in my ear. It's, uh, you know, but it was very helpful. Thank you, Matthias. Matthias is in his head. That's what it is. Yeah, exactly. Hearing voices. Uh, okay, verse uh, four and five together. It says, and my speech and my preaching was not with enticing words of man's wisdom, but in demonstration of the spirit and of power so that your faith should not stand in the wisdom of men, but in the power of God. Okay, Brother Chris, why don't you go first on verse 5? Yeah, that your faith should not stand in the wisdom of men. Uh, again, as Paul has done many, many times, he's doubling down on this information just to make sure that everybody understands what he's saying. Um, so this is the same point that we've been talking about from the beginning. Uh, he didn't want it to be in the wisdom of man. That's what the orators of that time, the Greeks, it's their wisdom. And I think it, I think it's a it's a deep thing for him to be pointing that out. It's saying that the wisdom of God, he's separating that from the wisdom of men. How often had these people that, that Paul's talking to at the beginning, how often had they heard these other men speak? And how many different speakers went out there and, and stood up on the uh, podium and, and talked about all these, these crazy, marvelous things that a lot of people uh, probably didn't understand. And that's what was considered wisdom. Whoa, I mean, and, and it was all just, um, it was all just uh, mesmerizing uh, speeches. But again, uh, Paul is just preaching Jesus Christ and, you, and the power of God. That's it. Um, not complicated, not overwhelming, uh, but also, as Renee pointed out, using the, the, the power. Um, he, he was gifted with God's power, we believe. Um, I don't know what demonstrations he made, if any, but I'll, I'll bet if we're talking to someone that we really know uh, is the Holy Spirit is speaking through them, we can feel that. We can, we can um, grasp the presence of God around us. Uh, yeah, so that your faith should not stand in the wisdom of men. He's just making the same point. Mm -hmm. Okay. Okay. Uh... All right, Renee. Um, Verse five. Well, we know faith come by hearing and hearing by the word of God. So I think, uh, it, you know, it's important here. And there's, you know, there's a, a big discussion now on this. And I, I have seen quite a few. Brother Dave was talking about people falling away from the faith. And it was my gut feeling these people had never been convinced that Jesus really is who he is and what he did. Uh, yeah, and that's why they fell away. So the the reason Paul is saying this is because he wants God Himself to convince them through His power, mm -hmm. the message of His Word, and the manifestation of the power that Paul is having. We know he did miracles and healings and so forth, and accompanying that with the message of the cross made the cross the focus. It made Jesus the focus, and so once we he can come and prove he's being sent by God Himself through the power and then giving them uh, the message the testimony of God, which is uh, what Jesus has done for us. And he can show them in the scriptures that it was promised of old, that this would happen, that that conversion they'd have would be by the power of God, not in the wisdom of men, not because he persuaded them well, but because the evidence convinced them God himself had shown them the truth. Amen. Yes, amen. Uh, I uh, want to represent uh, one of Matthias's thoughts. I've heard him express this numerous times. And uh, I say amen. I, I totally agree. Uh, Matthias, I, he never really told me his history in his whole life. I, but I believe he does have some experience as a salesman. Uh, and in, in, the, in that profession, uh, I did spend many years in sales. And uh, I was very successful. Uh, I, I won all the awards that a salesman could win. And uh, but enough about me boasting about it. I just want you to know that I understand the the, the, the principles of salesmanship and closing the deal. Uh, but Matthias says, and I and I agree with this. It's not our job 
to sell them on the gospel, and it's certainly not our job to close the deal and make them a believer right now. Um, it's our job to uh, share the gospel, and we don't know if we're planting or watering, but God uh, makes the increase. And, and uh, so this verse here, I believe, is... Uh, that's what I'm getting out of that verse five is that, that your faith should not stand in the wisdom of men. Uh, it should not be your, your uh, believing or not believing should not be determined by how impressive the man is and his oratory and his persuasion and his uh, skills at debate. But it should be in the power of God. God needs to persuade you. Uh, we tell you the simple facts and we will also will answer your questions. But it's between you and God. You have to wrestle with God about this. And, and uh, uh, whether you believe or not, that it, we, we cannot impose that on people. Wait a minute, Brother Luke. Yes. I want to make sure I understand you. Are you saying it? Are you saying it's not our job? You're saying it's it's God's job to convince someone? Yeah, I, I'm, I'm saying not only not only are we uh, trying to do too much, but many times we're putting a, a great burden on ourselves, thinking that if we don't succeed in making someone into a believer, then uh, we failed. And especially if it's a loved one and we cannot persuade them, uh, we are uh, crushed by it. Yep. And we need to just accept the fact that uh, all we can do is all we can do. That's it. We pray for them. We tell them uh, the, the gospel. And if need be, we'll tell them again and again, as long as they're they're willing to listen. And we, we try to answer their questions. But uh, uh, don't think that you have the power or even the responsibility to make someone believe. Right. Thank you. I just think it's important that, that um, people understand what you're saying there. Yeah. Super important. Uh, Okay, now did I, I don't know if I read that in the Amplified. Uh, uh, let me read the Amplified verse four and five. It says, and my message and my preaching were not in persuasive words of wisdom using clever rhetoric, but they were delivered in demonstration of the Holy Spirit operating through me and of his power stirring the minds of the listeners and persuading them. So it's God that will persuade them and stir their minds and verse yes. five, so that your faith would not rest on the wisdom and rhetoric of men, mm. but on the power of God. And verse five, I think there's a footnote in the NABRE. No, there's not. Okay. All right. So we're ready to go to verse uh, six. Um, uh, Renee or Crips, any more on verse four and five? No, I just think that's, that's I, I love what you said there. And I, what immediately comes to mind is all the people that go, uh, they they say soul winning. And Joseph has a has actually a story about that. He told in his testimony where, um, you know, they went out there and they said, how many souls did you save today, Joseph? And they're, they're just keeping track of it, keeping track of how many. It's, they're just marking numbers on a list. And it, it, it's it's not us that saves anyone. I've never saved a single person. I never have. Jesus is the one that did the work. Jesus is the one that saves. The Holy Spirit is the one that brings the harvest. We're not responsible for saving a single soul. Yeah. Uh, I will make a comment about this concept of uh, keeping score of your success in winning souls. Uh, um, I told you I went to Billy Graham crusade back about 1970, and I went forward at the altar call, and, but I didn't understand the gospel and believe at that time, but I, I went forward and, but many years later, uh, I guess around 14 years later or 16 years later, that's when I became a believer. But I do, I do know that uh, the Billy Graham crusade and others like it have come into uh, a, a lot of criticism over what they call decision tracking and numbering their decisions, decisions for Christ. And um, there was, of course, a great... Uh, uh, que uh, questioning of uh, the, were there re these real believers, were there real conversions, or were they just people that got caught up in emotion and uh, uh, or just decided to make a, a decision? And, uh, but uh, 
So this idea of uh, people making a decision um, that Matthias talks about a lot, uh, this is not uh, a, a, an issue that is um, brand new. Uh, this is a, a, an issue that people have been asking about, wondering about for decades that I'm aware of, mm -hmm. uh, thinking that we just need to get decisions for Christ. And it's not up to us to make to get a decision out of someone. Nope. Uh, when they hear yeah, the good news, convinced by God, God's got to convince you of the truth. And nobody can convince you otherwise because God has shown you the truth. It's not about, uh, you know, uh, well, that sounds good. I think, you know, it's, it, it's, you've got to be convinced that what God has said about his son is actually the truth. And, and there, there's, there is nothing in us that's doing anything, really. I mean, I, I assume you could reject it. I know many people do reject Christ, um, but it, it has to be God shows you that truth. And, and that's what uh, I think Paul's uh, doing there. And by the way, I don't see how anybody gets saved at a Billy Graham concert. He, concert is what it is because he, he makes he makes it about what we do and how we live instead of what Jesus did. He doesn't make salvation clear on how to be saved. He makes it about, you know, how you live your life for Christ instead of Christ giving his life for us. And that's confusing yeah. to people. And I'll tell you something else crazy about Billy Graham, because uh, I've watched him for many years. Some of you, if you're if you're young, you don't have this kind of experience of following his crusades and his, his message. But I remember uh, the, in the beginning, uh, he was preaching hellfire and brimstone, repent of your sins, change your life, all that. It was faith plus plus works and repentance of sins and all that was the message. So that was a, uh, a heretical gospel mm -hmm. message. Uh, but near the end of his life, his message changed. But it wasn't faith alone. It was universalism that everybody, everybody, uh, whether you, even an atheist is going to go to heaven. It was it was shocking to me that he went from one extreme to the, to the other. Um, all right, let's look at verse six in the KJV. Howbeit we speak wisdom among them that are perfect, yet not the wisdom of this world, nor of the princes of this world that come to naught, but, in verse 7, but we speak the wisdom of God in a mystery, even the hidden wisdom, which God ordained before the world unto his glory. Uh, I'm going to have to read 8 also which none of the princes of this world knew for they for had they known it they would not have crucified the lord of glory oh sister uh verse six seven and eight this mystery uh what is it that they didn't know that all the nations all the gentile nations would be grafted in with believing israel to be the body of christ that salvation would come to all nations, not just the Jews. Amen. Right? Is that what it um, Also, when I, I was going to ask you guys, where it says, how be it we speak wisdom among them that are perfect. Is he referring to uh, those that have trusted in Christ and are now perfected by his blood? Yep. Perfected? Okay. I, I just, I, I thought that might be what he's talking about when he says, we speak wisdom among them that are perfect. Yet not the wisdom of this world, nor of the princes of this world that come to naught, meaning they die. They're not yep. eternal. It doesn't come from an eternal, ancient source of wisdom. But we speak the wisdom of God in a mystery, even the hidden wisdom which God ordained before the world unto our glory, which none of the princes of this world knew. For if they had known it, they would have not crucified the Lord of glory. And the princes there are spiritual principalities, I believe. Uh, the forces of darkness when it says none of the princes of this world knew for if they had known it They would not have crucified the Lord of glory. I believe that's the principalities That's why it says nor of the princes of this world that come to naught. They're going to be destroyed mm -hmm. I think that's what it's talking about Amen. The princes like real princes didn't crucify Jesus, but the principalities the spiritual wickedness the princes of this world did have him crucified yeah. by influencing men. So I yeah. think that's clearly talking about spiritual entities. Yeah. Uh, we, we, we know that um, the congregation 
is not in complete agreement on what dispensations are. And um, I think Renee and I, I, I don't, I'm not sure about Crips, I haven't discussed this with you. Renee, uh, Matthias, Daniel and I, we've all agreed that when Paul used the word dispensation, he means it's the act of dispensing more revelation, making the message clearer and clearer throughout the Bible, um, and rather than a period of history where there was a different set of rules for salvation. Um, and, and I think that this mystery that Paul talks about the mystery uh, at a different point, and he, he, he says the mystery, he actually says this is the mystery that the Gentiles will be included in this. So Rene is absolutely right. Paul tells us what the mystery is. His, his mystery is that it's not only about Israel and the Jewish people being, and he didn't just come to save them, but he's the savior of the whole world, all Gentiles too. But I think that in this particular verse, he's talking about the, the mystery being the revelation, the details about this person, this savior, and how he was going to accomplish it, gradually being clarified with more and more details. Uh, because the idea of this cross, um, uh, back in Genesis, uh, there's no reference to the cross. Um, uh, the, the, the details start to get cleared up in, in uh, Isaiah 53 and Psalm uh, 22, uh, where you get some details and you, you can understand what he's talking about. Now, in hindsight, they're talking about the piercing of the hands and the feet and this cross and Golgotha there. Uh, and then gradually, more and more, we understand the details of how Jesus, the Savior, it, now we know his name is Jesus. Now we know how he accomplished our salvation. And so I think that, uh, let me read that again. Uh, verse uh, starting with verse six. Howbeit we speak wisdom among them that are perfect, yet not the wisdom of this world, nor the princes of this world that come to naught, but we speak the wisdom of God in a mystery, even the hidden wisdom which God ordained before the world unto our glory. So the idea of the uh, covering uh, of um, um, Adam and Eve. God providing that covering and a death of the animal, the shed blood being necessary, rather than them solving the problem by working to sew the fig leaves together. That's the first indication of what was going to happen, but it's it's not clear. It's a picture and a shadow. And so that's why it's a mystery. They didn't really understand that. We can look back in hindsight and understand all these pictures and shadows perfectly now. And then in uh, verse eight, which none of the princes of this world knew, for had they known it. In other words, if the details of the cross was clearly spelled out for everybody and was as obvious to them as it is to us now, they would not have crucified the Lord if they knew that, hey, through the crucifixion, this is how the victory will come. So let me get your thoughts on that, Rene or Cripps. Go ahead, Rene, you first. All right. You go ahead, Jason. I, I got some thoughts I'm writing down. Can you give me a minute? Sure. So okay. th the bottom line of all this for me is exactly what we've we've said it is. That uh, it w I like what you said, Brother Luke. It wasn't just for uh wasn't just for the Jews. It was for all people uh from the beginning of time. Um so many people try to uh make it just be about the Jews, and it's not. It's for all of us. He had this plan the whole time, and it was a mystery that wasn't revealed to all people until the time, and Paul is revealing that mystery. Wisdom of God in a mystery, even the hidden wisdom, so this was a hidden wisdom that's being revealed now, which God ordained before the world unto glory. It's all here. It's all stated very, very clearly what it is. Um, and going back up to the, the top, to verse 6, how be it we speak wisdom among them that are perfect? I do agree with Renee, that is us. We're made perfect by him. Not that there's anything perfect in and of ourselves. We're made perfect unto him. And he compares it to the princes of the world, which has come to nothing. Naught is nothing, but we speak the wisdom of God and a mystery, uh, which God ordained, yeah, we already read that one, which none of the princes of this world knew. For if they'd known it, this is a good point to make. If they'd known it, they would have never crucified the Lord of glory. That's a fact. Why would they have crucified him if they understood that he was also uh, 
saving them as well. It wasn't just for the Jewish people. I think it's fantastic. And, I, and I'm glad that we're grafted in. I'm glad that just because we weren't born of Abraham, that he still offers us the same grace, the same love, the same forgiveness that he offers them. I, uh, I'm sorry I asked you to go first. I was looking for a verse in Psalms that I had read recently, and I wanted to show you, you know, it's all over. The mystery is all over the Law and the Prophets. Oh, yeah. It's just we can only see it in hindsight. Sure. You know, you couldn't put it together yet. But Psalms 102, this is why I needed a couple minutes. It says, Psalms 102, 18, this shall be written for the generation to come. And the people which shall be created shall praise the Lord. So they hadn't even created yet. Like the, uh, it's not Israel. It's a people that will be created. Amen. Uh, and, and so that's speaking of the future of other nations, just like the prophecy. I forgot exactly, but to paraphrase it, it says they, that I shall call them my people that are not a people. Yep. Something right. like that. So yep. we do see this mystery all over scripture, but it couldn't really be understood until after it was fulfilled. Amen. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that, that's why there's a saying that the, the Old Testament is the New Testament concealed. Within the Old Testament, all the events of the New Testament and the people of the New Testament, they're in there. But it's concealed. It's shadows and pictures. And you don't have the name of Jesus but you have the person uh, that of Jesus in the Old Testament, as far as uh, looking forward to this person that would be, uh, who would be the Savior, the Christ, the Messiah, um, and uh, you know, the, the details. Uh, and then it says, so the Old Testament is the New Testament concealed, and the New Testament is the Old Testament revealed. That's why Matthias said that he's really enjoying studying the Old Testament now, even more so than the New Testament. Why? Because once you really understand the New Testament, you can go back and you read the Old Testament and you really get blown away because you can see all these pictures and shadows. Whereas if you didn't understand the New Testament, you read the Old Testament, it, it just goes right over your head. You don't get it. Okay, let's go to... Uh, Let's look at these verses here in the, uh, uh, no, in the KJV, let's go to ver the next verse. It's uh, verse uh, nine in the KJV. But as it is written, I hath not seen nor ear heard, neither have entered into the heart of man the things which God hath prepared for them that love him. Wow. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. wow. wow. Okay, brother Cripps. Oh my gosh! I love verse, are you blown away by that verse? I am. I mean, I've heard it before, but I'm blown away from it now because here's the beauty of of scripture, of looking at scripture. I there's there's some scriptures I've mentioned Romans five one through eight that I memorized when I was in the second grade, and I never forgot that one. And there's a couple others, some in Psalms and some other verses I never forgot. Um, the spiritual warfare one, wrestling out against flesh and blood. That was one I memorized early on in my life, and I never forgot it. And I'm thankful for that. This, But these scriptures get into our hearts. He writes them in our hearts. So then later, we're not even thinking about it, and some situation comes up. You're talking to the right person in that moment. The verses come to mind. This is the way he works. And, and all of that information, though, when I read the same verse all these years later, when we're doing these broadcasts and I read it again and, and we're amplifying, each one of us is amplifying, and I learn something new every time. We all can learn something new because his word is living. There literally is life in the words. And this one in particular, especially. But as it was written, I hath not seen nor ear heard, neither have entered into the heart of man the things which God hath prepared for them that love him. That means we can't imagine it. If you can imagine it, it's beyond that. If your mind can come up with a concept of what's prepared for us, you might as well just scrap it because you can't imagine what, what he has in store for us. And that blows my mind. If I can imagine something in my mind and I think, well, that'd be cool if we could do that in an eternity, I might as well just forget it. What he has planned for us is beyond that. We haven't seen it. 
We haven't heard it. Neither has it entered into our hearts the things that God has prepared for them that love him. That, I, I don't know about anybody else, but that blows the top of my head clean off. It's just ridiculous. Um, and and, it, and it's, it's lovely and amazing and incredible and intriguing. I can't wait to find out what these things are that he has for us, and we don't deserve it. None of us deserves it, but he gives it to us willingly because of his love for us, because he wants to reconcile us back to him through Christ. Okay, I want to talk about the verse, but first I need to talk to the chat room. Chat room, please, everybody, please listen to me now. Uh, we, uh, our congregation is based on the uh, the uh, creed. It's an ancient creed in uh, in essentials unity, and the essentials are the deity of Christ, faith alone in Christ alone for salvation and eternal security. In essential unity, we, we are dogmatic. We insist you better agree on these things. It's not asking too much to understand and agree on these three basic things, essentials of Christianity. Uh, but we also say in non-essentials, liberty. We don't have to agree. In fact, I find it fascinating when people disagree. It's an opportunity for me to learn a different point of view. But if I do challenge another person's point of view, uh, in all things, charity, that is the third point of the creed. In essentials, unity. In non-essentials, liberty. In all things, charity. That means you better be polite when you express your disagreement. If I disagree with anybody in the panel about something, I go out of my way to say, well, I understand your position. That's very interesting. I see it differently. This is how I see it. I'm not trying to prove them wrong and win an argument publicly and humiliate them. If that's the way you're going to interact and, and, and conduct yourself in the chat room, then you're not following this these uh, principles that we, we insist upon. So, yeah, you don't have to agree in the chat room, but you better be polite about it. Go out of your way to be polite as you disagree. And if you're going to be uh, accusatory and uh, rude, uh, it's not going to be tolerated. So, Hendrix, you're the captain of the moderators. Uh, anybody that's a moderator has the authority to deal with these problems, but particularly Hendrix, uh, you're the one I'm relying on to make sure that chat room is running correctly. Okay. All right. Let's uh, let's go to um, that was. Oh, Renee, did you talk about uh, verse uh, ten, uh, verse nine? Uh, no, but I, I want to remind people. I'm sorry, Matthias, what? Yeah, verse 9. Yeah. Eye has not seen nor ear heard, neither have entered into the heart of man the things which God's prepared for them that love him. I, um, I, I like to remind people that every one of the apostles, when he's writing to the believers, is always reminding them of the promise that's ahead of them. He never says, you're going to lose it if you don't act right. He just says to encourage them to continue to grow and to live godly and holy. He tells them and reminds them of the promise of, of what is ahead of us because of what Jesus has done for us. He, he confirms and edifies by confirming the promise of God, not by telling you it's resting on you so you better get scared you'll lose it. You won't see any of that teaching in any of these epistles. And this is just another example of him uh, glorifying God for the promises that are in Christ. But as it's written, eyes not seen nor ear heard, neither has entered into the heart of man. The things which God has prepared for them that love him. And that's why you'll see carnal things like the Muslims believe they're going to have virgins, uh, perpetual. Vir it sure doesn't sound like heaven for the virgin, does it? to be de-virginized every single night. This is their carnal thinking. This is the best man can come up with for heaven. But God has a true spiritual kingdom, a heaven that we can't even fathom. And uh, these are the promises we stand for. And they are always using these promises to uh, motivate us to, to hang in there. Mm -hmm. Amen. Hang in there for sure. I, uh, I did a I have a playlist titled 50 Hours in Heaven, and uh, it's it's uh, not a, 
a, a story about I died and went to heaven for 50 hours and I'm here to tell you about it. So don't get the wrong impression. <laughs> <laughs> the, uh, the 50 hours in heaven is a, a study about heaven that happens to be 50 hours long. Okay. I don't know how long you guys could talk about heaven. Most people couldn't talk about heaven for more than 10 minutes and you run out of stuff to talk about because it's the most neglected subject in the Bible. That's very unfortunate. But one of the, this is a verse that always makes me think of heaven. That's, that's how I uh, interpret this verse. As it, but by the way, if someone can tell me where it is written, in verse 9 it says, but as it is written, and I'm looking at the other translations, the Amplified and the NABRE. Neither one of them has a footnote or a reference to where it is in the Old Testament. But it says, uh, but as it is written, so that means that it's already written in the Law and the Prophets somewhere. As it is written, I hath not seen, nor ear heard, neither have entered into the heart of man the things which God hath prepared for the, them that love him. Uh, that's talking about our eternal life in the new heavens and the new earth. We it says nobody has seen it. How uh, no one has seen the glory of that. that what it's going to be like. No one's heard it. No one's. It's no one has entered into the heart of man. Let me see how it phrases it in the amplified because um, I've heard it expressed a number of different ways. Uh, things which the eye hath not seen and the ear hath has not heard and which have not entered the heart of man. Um, let me look up at it in the NABRE. Uh, what eye has not seen and ear has not heard and what the what has not entered the human heart. Well, I've heard uh, also expressed that no one has imagined when it says that uh, uh, neither have entered into the heart of man that no one has conceived it, no one has imagined it, no one could comprehend. You couldn't even imagine the magnitude of, of, of your salvation, your eternal life, and your eternity. How grand it's going to be, how majestic. And uh, I, to me, the, the, only, the word I can think of that expresses the greatest level of joy is bliss. Could you imagine having bliss? For even even a second or five seconds, imagine five seconds of bliss. I chased that with heroin for years. Yeah, I'm serious. That that was what I need. I wanted. I wanted uh just to feel good and blissful. Yeah, that was what I was. Well, I, I think bliss is the highest state of happiness and joy, and and, uh, and, and I believe that's what heaven will be. I think we'll have a state of bliss all throughout eternity and i think that's what verse nine here is telling us about and, and can't you get excited about that okay if you remain focused on this person of jesus and this promise that uh you can't even imagine how good it's going to be in eternity and god that you can't imagine how much good god has prepared for you mm -hmm. amen okay we're going to go to hey, brother luke uh, I'm sorry to interrupt. The, the, the next few verses about the spirit, they won't make sense unless we do like four of them together because it's like an ongoing thought and it sounds confusing. And if you try to confuse, say one, it gives away what the next verse is saying. Can we just do uh, like. Yeah, OK. Um, I'll try to read uh, three 10, from 10 to uh, 12, like like okay. those three or four. I'm going to read through 13. OK, perfect. Okay, uh, 11 through 13. For what man knoweth the things of a man, save the spirit of man which is in him? Okay, yes, I'm speaking 10. I'm skipping 10. What is that voice I'm hearing? The Holy Spirit's guiding me. Is take that your, the audible voice of God? Take your, yeah. take your I've, never, I've never heard it before. People told me that God speaks to them. And this is the first time ever I'm hearing the voice of God. I didn't know. I didn't know the Holy Spirit sounded kind of like Matthias. Yeah, yeah. For, the, for the congregation, you don't know Matthias is uh, informing us, but I guess you can't hear his voice because he hasn't been <laughs> set up. But he says, you're, you're skipped 10. You're skipped 10. <laughs> okay. So I'll well, start with 10. At 10. least, 
oh. 10 through 13. Okay. But God hath revealed them unto us by his spirit, for the spirit searches all things, yea, the deep things of God. For what man knoweth the things of a man, save the spirit of man which is in him? Even so, the things of God knoweth no man, but the spirit of God. Now, we have received not the spirit of the world, but the spirit which is of God, that we might know the things that are freely given to us of God, mm. which things also we speak, not in the words which man's wisdom teacheth, but which the Holy Ghost teacheth, comparing spiritual things with spiritual. Boom. Yeah. Okay. Renee, you wanted it all in context. There's right? the boom. I was waiting for it. Boom. Whenever you... There, there, it is. there it is, Renee. There it is. Um, all right. I, I want to read it again. But God has revealed them unto us by his spirit. Uh, what has he revealed? The things that he's prepared. Uh, for the spirit searches all things, yea, the deep things of God. For what man knoweth the things of a man, save the spirit of man which is in him? Even so, the things of God knoweth no man but the Spirit of God. And then all that comes into this. Now we have received, not the Spirit of the world, like I was saying, the Muslims have that spirit, that carnal spirit. That's why their heaven is something of carnality. But the Spirit, which is of God, that we might know the things that are freely given to us of God. That's why he's saying, you know, no man can know a per, uh, 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 no, no man can know another man's spirit. Uh, and then it goes on to show us the separation, the difference between the man of a spirit and the man and the spirit of God. And then it says when it's combined, now we can know what God has for us because the spirit of God dwells within the spirit of man. Yep. So uh, that's how we know the things that are freely given to us of God. And, uh, and I this verse I've actually used to show you why people deny that salvation's through Christ and why people deny our eternal security. And this verse explains it. Now we have received not the spirit of the world, but the spirit which is of God, that we might know the things that are freely given us of God. Why do we know that? Because the spirit bears witness to that truth in us. And if you don't have the spirit in you, because you've never trusted only in Christ, then you don't have that spirit that gives you witness and tells you what's freely giving of God. That's it. What he's given to us. We have the witness in ourselves. Yep. So that's why we know these things are given to us freely of God. And that's why we love him so much. Yep. We trust him. We believe his promise. Yep. Mm -hmm. All right. Brother Cripps. Yeah. So again, he starts out this whole chapter and separating himself from the wisdom of man, just to make this point right here verse 10 through 13. Um, we have no knowledge of anything. We, what we have before we're, before we're saved is the, only the wisdom of the world. So we're basing things on, on potentially lies, all lies, um, not based on any kind of truth that anyone has. Yes, yeah, so sometimes man stumbles, stumbles across a gem of something that happens to be true. But when we get saved and that dead spirit is quickened and we have this literally the spirit of God in us, then, and I love this word, then the spiritual things that are freely given, Renee capitalized on that one part, freely given to us of God. He wants to give us that. And we get it simply by reading his word, by having a relationship with him, by opening ourselves up to spiritual knowledge. And that spirit communes with our spirit, and we get to understand all this stuff. Um, when we struggle with something, all we have to do is bring it to him and say, I'm really struggling with this verse. I don't know what it means. And he reveals to us the answers. We don't have to walk around not understanding scripture. Now, I do agree that all we have to understand, as Brother Luke said toward the beginning, um, we don't have to understand all the doctrine. If we miss all the deeper things of scripture, but understand the gospel, then we're good. Luke, I'm distracted by your primping, Luke. <laughs> primping. 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 You look, look good, though. You have plenty of hair uh, left for a man your age. That's for sure. Um, 
all, all these things are spiritual wisdom that we can only get when we have a relationship with him. A man in the world can be wise. A man in the world can have a lot of worldly knowledge. But how is it possible without the Holy Spirit living inside them and communing with them? How is it, under, how is it possible for them to understand spiritual things? So when people don't understand these concepts and they just can't wrap their mind, no matter how intelligent they are, and and we say to them, if you would just look into these these things and and believe it, then it would be clear to you. Then when you look at scripture, your eyes are open and your ears are open, and you're able to understand spiritual things. We can't understand it without his spirit. We can't. But when we have a spirit in us, working in us, and communing with us, then we can understand it. The Holy Ghost teaches comparing spiritual things with spiritual. It's beautiful. Mm -hmm. Okay. Well, I'm going to take the advantage of the Amplified before I comment and uh, read those verses <laughs> of the Amplified. Okay. Uh, verses, what was it, Nine, uh, 10 through 13. For God has unveiled them and revealed them to us through the Holy Spirit. For the Spirit searches all things diligently, even sounding and measuring the profound depths of God, the divine counsels and things far beyond human understanding. For what person knows the thoughts and motives of a man except the man's spirit within him? So also, no one knows the thoughts of God except the Spirit of God. Now, we have received not the Spirit of the world, but the Holy Spirit, who is from God, so that we may know and understand the wonderful things freely given to us by God. We also speak of these things, not in words taught or supplied by human wisdom, but in those taught by the Spirit, combining and interpreting spiritual thoughts with spiritual words for those being guided by the Holy Spirit. Amen. Yeah. Okay. I, I don't want to comment. I'll just leave it at that. <laughs> <laughs> I'm making those words my words. Yeah, he amplified it by the amplifier. Yeah. Okay. Uh, all right, so we'll go back to the next verse. Uh, look at it in the KJV, verse 14. But the natural man receiveth not the things of the Spirit of God, for they are foolishness unto him, neither can he know them because they are spiritually discerned. Brother Chris, why don't you go first on that one? Yeah, there it is. It deserves a boom right there. It's it, it, kind of what I was just referring to. They can't get it. They cannot understand it. So why are we mad at them that we, we show them scripture, talk to them, and they're not saved, they're not believers, they do not believe, so it seems like foolishness to them. In fact, they might even call you a fool for believing in invisible God somewhere up there in the sky that we've never seen or heard ourselves. It's foolishness to them. They have no no understanding of it. And and oftentimes looking at us, they just think that we're silly, ridiculous people to believe in a fairy tale. What to them is a fairy tale. Their senses are all they trust. Yeah. 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 But the funny thing is God uses our senses to prove himself to us. The heavens declare the glory of God, and his firmament showeth his handiwork. Amen. It's uh, all there for us to see. Yeah. Now, I, I noticed two things here. One is that, that I didn't look ahead, so I didn't realize there's 16 verses in this chapter, uh, and it's also uh, 758, which makes it 1058 in the east. So it's time for us to start closing this down. But... Uh, so I'm going to finish these last few verses here, 14, 15, and 16 together for Renee. Okay. Let me read them all together, Renee. Uh, but the natural man receiveth not the things of the Spirit of God, for they are foolishness unto him. Neither can he know them, because they are spiritually discerned. But he that is spiritual judgeth all things. Yet he himself is judged of no man. For who hath known the mind of the Lord? that he may instruct him. But we have the mind of Christ. Oh, Renee. <laughs> I love when you were saying that gentleman was saying it's repent isn't actually just a change of mind. It's an exchange of mind. Because I, there. when I read that verse, yes. I was going to say that. Go ahead and talk, talk about yes. this. Uh, he's saying that, you know, repent isn't just a change of mind. It's an exchange of mind. And 
this section of verses ex explains so well why people that haven't really trusted in Christ, they, they know that he's got in the flesh, or they might not know, but they know he died for our sins, but they don't think we have eternal life just because of that. They just, they don't get it. It's, it's, they have partial blindness. And the reason they deny our eternal security and our blessed assurance and that Jesus did it all on the cross is because they haven't, they don't have the Holy Spirit. See, I said Satan's greatest trick is getting people to live the Christian life and never being born again. So they'll try to be disciples through their own will worship uh, and follow Jesus by trying to mimic his actions, but they never get his mind and they never get his heart. Wow. They never trust in him. Yes. When this verse says, uh, which things also we speak not in the words of a man's wisdom, but the Holy Ghost teaches comparing spiritual things with spiritual. The Holy Ghost teaches us truth. And that's why when you get enough of us together that are born again, even if we disagree on certain things, eventually a lot of us will come to like mind. Yeah. A lot of things. Or you'll hear five different born again believers that are mature that are studied the scriptures. They've never heard anybody else get the revelation. You get them together and it's all been revealed to them. Yeah. I've had people uh, discover a meaning of a verse that only I had, I had heard. I had never seen it written in a commentary ever. And then I've spoken to someone and said, you know what? That same thing was revealed to me, but I just wasn't sure. I had nobody to talk to about it. Yep. Yep. It's amazing. That's why I stay away from commentaries first. I'll read read it first. Then I talk to a man of God and run it by them. Then I check commentaries yeah. because I, I never want to be influenced or have something blocked that the spirit might be showing me. Um, but it says, neither can he know them. Yep. Like Jason said, why were we even mad at him? If our gospel will be here to be here to them that are lost, we need to get them saved. Yep. What I get upset about is them calling me names and attacking me and telling me I'm a false teacher when I'm giving them the truth of the gospel and I want them saved. Right. But that's the false converse. Though. Right. It's the false, the false converse that are doing that. The yeah. Just general non-believers aren't attacking. Because you. I know they don't have the spirit. If they have the yeah. spirit, they might not understand fully, but they certainly wouldn't be hostile to it. That's exactly correct. There's a difference. There's a huge difference. Between confusion and being hostile or hating yep. the message of God's grace. And they and what do they say? The carnal man responds the same. Well, that would just mean you could do whatever you want. Not yep. realizing we have the mind of Christ. Yep. We have the mind of Christ. That's we the tell. want to do this. It harms us. Yeah. When we do it, people don't get that. It says, for who has known the mind of the Lord that he may instruct him, but we have the mind of Christ. Yes. I, I love that. that. That was, that's just awesome, brother. Like I hadn't heard it put that way before. Yeah. yeah. The, uh, the one you're referring to is Malcolm Smith. I just put his channel on my homepage uh, as one of the recommended channels, Malcolm Smith. I listened to a couple of his messages today, and um, he's the one where I referenced, and now uh, this verse, it's amazing, because this verse, actually, I never noticed it. I never thought of it that way, but uh, God, guy, you know, you, you're you working in some mysterious ways, Lord. That's amazing. <laughs> uh, yesterday, Malcolm Smith says, metanoia. Uh, means change of mind, but he says it should be understood as exchange of mind. Now, you instead of your old mind, you have the mind of God. And I said, that's great. And then we read this verse here, and it actually says, For who hath known the mind of the Lord, that he may instruct him, but we have the mind of Christ. So it is uh, brilliant uh, and uh, these are things that have just blown me away. And it's for 32 years over and over and over again, I'm blown away by these scriptures and these uh, Holy Spirit filled uh, teachers that I know and love. Um, okay, let's. Re I'm gonna read those last three verses here in the Amplified and get Cripp's thoughts on it. 14, 15 and 16 says, but the natural unbelieving man does not accept the things that that is the teachings and revelations of the spirit of god 
for their foolishness. And it's, it's absurd and illogical to him. Yeah. And he is incapable of understanding them because they are spiritually discerned and appreciated. And, and he is unqualified to judge spiritual matters. But the spiritual man, the spiritually mature Christian, judges all things, that's questions, uh, examines, and applies what the Holy Spirit reveals, yet is himself judged by no one. That The, the unbeliever cannot judge and understand the believer's spiritual nature. Mm. Or who has known the mind and purposes of the Lord so as to instruct him? Mm. But we have the mind of Christ to be guided by his thoughts and purposes. Amen. Oh, Brother Cripps? Well, that laid it out perfectly. I, I, I could easily say that I don't need to amplify it anymore. It's already been amplified. Uh, but the, the one point I did want to respond to is verse 15. But he that spiritually judge, judges all things. So that's us that, that are saved. We judge all things. Yet, yet uh, he himself is judged of no man. This should be the liberty that we have in Christ. Not, not because we're so good and we've done all this stuff in order that no one can judge us but that Christ himself did all the work and because we're counting on him and not adding anything of ourselves to it, there's no judgment for us. There's no judgment. And certainly someone that, that's uh, not a believer and doesn't have spiritual discernment, we shouldn't even get upset. It's different, uh, as I was saying to Renee, it's different with a, with a false convert that thinks that they have the mind of Christ when they have a tell that shows that they don't when they're attacking. They got a lot of legalism and, oh, zeal, yeah. and zeal, but yep. that's about it. Yeah, zeal for their uh, unforgiveness, their un, un, um, unbelieving behavior. It comes out and we can recognize them um, and we recognize the people that they're learning from because they're the fruit of the of the false prophets and false teachers. Yeah, a bad tree can't produce good fruit. You can't get a true convert from a false prophet. Nope. Yeah. It never happens like that. It never happens. They have to be transformed. They have to be born again by believing the truth. And I how said it's not possible. Right. Bad tree cannot. That's right. Good. Yep. Yeah. All right then. Uh, um, so that's uh, uh, the chapter. You know that. The, uh, the numbering of verses and the numbering of chapters were not in the original uh, manuscripts. Uh, these were added much later, and some people believe that the, the chapters and verses numbering system is also inspired, and it's interesting to study that subject, but um, sometimes a chapter division is, seems to be correct. Seems like maybe there's a change of subject and a new chapter, new new thoughts are coming out, uh, but uh, a lot of times that's not the case at all. But matter of fact, there's one place I can't remember exactly which one I'm thinking of now, but I know that there's verse one and two of a chapter, and people really support that make a profound conclusion, and but if they go back to the previous chapter and read a few verses earlier, they see that they can, they're all connected and it's a totally different conclusion that you come to. So I agree with that, brother Luke. I've seen things where if it don't stop where the verse stops, keep going, and it makes a full like uh, revelation. Make but it, it it just so happens that uh, the time frame that we schedule for our programs on Wednesdays and uh, is is lapsed, and at the same time we're able to get through all of this this entire chapter. So that worked out well. Um, let's take a little time now uh, to. Uh, First, let's see if anybody in the chat room has. Uh, I am disappointed about the drama. I don't know exactly all the details, but I saw there was a problem. So I hope that my uh, rebuke, uh, you know, is understood and, and, oh. and, and heeded that uh, uh, you, you want to disagree on uh, some non, if you disagree on an essential, then don't, don't even get in the chat room if that's your purpose. You're not welcome if you're going to disagree with our essential doctrines. But if you're disagreeing on a non-essential, you have to go out of your way to be polite as you disagree. Okay, and uh, let's let's continue doing it. That's the way it's, we've been conducting ourselves, and that's why this works. Uh, we're not being rude with each other, or mm -hmm. uh, you know, condescending to each other. Uh, but is if there's something in the chat room here that you want to uh, 
uh, ask us before we close up tonight, put it in bold real quick, uh, a question or a comment you want us to respond to. Um, until I get something like that from the chat room, I'm going to go forward and, and do our closing remarks here. So, Brother Cripps, why don't you go first? Uh, I guess uh, sum up your thoughts on this study tonight, please. Certainly. Cer certainly. That's not a word. Certainly. Um, it, great study tonight. Um, the, the, I think the, my favorite verse in here is the one uh, talking about, oh, it's verse 10. But God hath revealed them. Nope, that's not the one. Uh, it's the it's the verse uh, where I hath not seen or ear hath not heard the things that He has prepared for them that love Him. Um, that's that's the one that I I want to take away with me tonight to um, focus more on on pray more about understanding what how huge that is to us, and that I can never figure out how wonderful the things that are prepared for us when we get to be with him. And for me, uh, just seeing his face and being able to fall to my knees and thank him for everything that he's done for me and that how it was impossible for me to be reconciled to God, but because of his sacrifice on the cross, he made it possible for me. And I can never repay him. There's nothing I can ever do to repay him for what he did. Um, I am undeserving, but because God loves me so much, he sent his son into the world to save me from sin and death. And I, I will always be grateful. And I just can't wait to see what he has for us. I'm just looking forward to it so much. Um, oh, it's verse 9. Uh, verse 9 is, is, is my favorite in this. And the other thing is, I, I think uh, he went a long way to point out that we don't care about the wisdom of men. So many people seem to uh, not believe biblical truth because of what they're told by men. And I just think that they're doing such a disservice to themselves. Um, if you look at Scripture, Scripture is sufficient for all things. Um, if, we, if, an, if there was not another book ever written on the face of the earth and we just had the Bible, it would be sufficient to have us live godly lives and to have a relationship with him and to get through everything without any issues, without any problems, that would be sufficient. Okay, amen. Uh, Brother Luke. Yes, go ahead, sister. I was just thinking, I'm so grateful you're not an alcoholic. <laughs> With a last name like Boozer, you'd never live it down. <laughs> it would follow you all your life. I think you'd never get past it. I'm sorry, I just think stupid things sometimes. It's yeah. not stupid. Uh, we have a, a guy real quick in the chat, Stephen. He said he has a friend who is really on a heavy suicidal oppression. I don't have the name, but if everybody can lift that person up tonight, I, I see a very strong spirit of suicide and oppression coming over uh, God's people right now. And uh, I, I, you know, my suggestion is to think on things that are good. That's what Paul says to do. Think on yeah. things that are truthful. Think on God's promises and his goodness, not evil and conspiracy and fear and all that stuff. Yeah. That, that that's that's gonna take your victory away. If there be any virtue, if there be any praise, think on these things. Yes, yes, absolutely. And I, I like tonight that he's uh uh Paul really discusses, you know, don't be convinced by someone just because they're charismatic or zealous or passionate. Uh the, the gospel message itself needs to be simple. It needs to focus on Jesus and it can be uh, given to you by God's wisdom and God's power, uh, not by wisdom of men. Uh, and he contrasts the wisdom and spirit of man with the wisdom and spirit of God. And when we trust in Christ, we have the spirit of God and his, his mind, the mind of Christ, so that we can discern the things freely given us of God. Yes. And uh, if you, there's a gentleman in the chat named Dynamics, and he said, I'm not even sure I'm saved. Well, you need to go to God and ask him to reveal to you who Jesus is and what he has accomplished on that cross. And he will do that for you. He will do that for you. Then you can know you have eternal life. Hmm. When that happens, you will know you have it because it's a promise God gave us if we trusted in what his son did for us. Freely given. That's right. Freely given. Good to see you guys. Yeah. Okay. Um, 
Well, I, first I want to just uh, thank and acknowledge uh, the wizard behind the curtain tonight, Brother Matthias. Uh, uh, I think that uh, uh, if you've been observing, just listening, or in the chat room, I, I know I've seen uh, how he's producing behind the screen, what he, how he's making this happen. And uh, I'm, I'm very thankful for his, not only his ability, but his willingness to help us uh, transition at this time. <laughs> YouTube is, is kind of going to make a, many of what these programs like ours will end up uh, closing shop. They, they won't know how to uh, adjust or adapt to the new program. So Matthias is uh, there making it happen for all of us, and we appreciate it. And um, the study was uh, wonderful, as usual. Um, the um, uh, Let me make an, an announcement that tomorrow night, uh, normally I don't have any programs on Thursday night, but uh, I have tomorrow night at 9.30 Eastern time, I have a, a live uh, discussion scheduled an interview with uh, Sister Paula, Bible literalist. She's in the chat room right now. And uh, I've been listening, I listened to her program on Tuesday, and uh, I've gotten to know her uh, better over the last week. And so we're going to uh, interview Sister Paula, uh, Bible literalist, tomorrow night. So join me live at 9.30 Eastern time for that. Also, in addition to the prayer for Stephen's friend, uh, I ask everybody to begin now praying for Mr. Rick Bob. Uh, he, he sent me an email today asking for prayer from the congregation. I'll, uh, I'll mention it again on Sunday to the congregation, but uh, he's having a big struggle going on right now and he needs our prayers. All right. Um, Okay, any uh, any other announcements or uh, final thoughts here? Um, Matthias, would you like to speak and say anything here in the end since you've... Uh, You're good? No one is good, only God is good. Yeah, I'm not sure what to say. Yeah, good. Thank you, Brother Matthias. I can resist it. <laughs> All right. Uh, okay, thank you, everybody, uh, especially on the East Coast, staying up so late with us. Uh, so uh, we'll see you uh, every Wednesday at 9.30 Eastern. Friday, we have the Fellowship Friday at 9.30 Eastern. By the way, on that program, I post the link publicly. So right now you have three people on the panel. Uh, but that night, uh, it's an open panel, so everybody can join. And we usually have about nine or ten people on the panel that night. So if you're dying to join us in the discussion as a panelist, that's a Friday a Fellowship Friday, 9.30 Eastern. And also don't forget to join us every Sunday for the Church of the Eternally Secure Sunday program. Uh, that's 5 p.m. Eastern time. Thank you to everybody. We love you. Uh, this is our congregation. And uh, bless you all in the name of our great Savior God. Hey, uh